Early this week, we met the Carrion King. We learned about the cursed lineage that he passes on, how that looks for each individual ghoul king, and how that dark magic affects every soul in his court. And today, we're going to end the week with a discussion of the hulking beasts that are commonly seen in every court. I'm referring to the Terrorgeists and the Zombie Dragons. Now, to be true, there isn't a ton of lore for each, so we'll close with a discussion on what the core concepts of this faction are and what make it so amazing and unique. So we'll start today by looking at the Terrorgeist, which is personally my favorite of the two. These things are colossal beasts of doom. They look and act sort of like an ungodly mix of vampire bat and a dragon. And if you are on the battlefield and you're fighting Flesh Eater Courts and the sky suddenly darkens, that is the shadow of a terrorgeist eclipsing the sun as it swoops down to annihilate you. These are giant carcasses of rotting flesh that seek out the biggest prey on the battlefield. They descend upon it and absolutely envelop it, wrap themselves around there, sink their fangs deep into its side, and drain it dry in an instant. And if you don't recognize them by their appearance, you certainly will by the sounds they make. Their scream is deafening. It is a roar with the power to outright kill people. And those spared from death who are standing nearby, like if you're just outside the kind of the, the deadly radius of it, you can find that your mind is absolutely broken and you'll kind of fall to the ground as a stuttering wreck while the rest of the courts wash over you. And with every enemy drained of blood, they can heal themselves in real time on the battlefield. So you can swipe at them with your sword if they kill somebody before you swipe again, the first wound is already healed up. When you combine that with the screaming power and the speed and the strength, it makes for an incredibly powerful opponent. And that's all before you drop a ghoul king on his back who's suddenly shooting off arcane bolts and things like that at your face. Now, there's a lot of debate about the origins of a terrorgeist. Some say they were once steeds of noble vampires, and the vampire put a spell on it like to keep it alive forever, and the vampire then died, but the beast keeps going but maybe that magic kind of twisted their appearance, no one's really quite sure. Some also think that they are kind of this naturally occurring creature that came to Shayish from Ulgu, which makes sense. The bats would appreciate the darkness of Ulgu, and maybe they were seeking out death magic. When they got here, Nagash was able to see value in them, enslaved them, and kind of gave him to his vampire counts. Regardless, there are no known living terrorgeists. They all have this kind of undead aspect to them. And they exist now across the realms, hiding in tall mountains and dark caves. They hang upside down as if a bat would, which is why I said they're like a bat and a dragon put together. And again, they are rotting, so there's all kinds of manner of creature crawling inside of them, feeding off the remains. There's entire families of bats that live inside of them, like hanging upside down from its ribs and stuff like that. So when the terrorgeist dies in battle, this huge horde of bats would have suddenly burst from its body and no one knows what's going on. And the next creature we're going to talk about is the zombie dragon. Made from the same kit, I really like the zombie dragon, and it is rare and extremely dangerous. A ghoul king can spend a lifetime searching for a dragon graveyard. They are extremely hard to find, because frankly dragons don't die very often. Every civilization will feel it nearby if they succeed. Now, right off the bat, this puts them kind of at a good contrast to terror guys. They're not naturally occurring. The terror guys can be found sleeping in caves and mountains, but these are truly dead until they're reanimated with dark magic. When their animator dies, meaning the ghoul king, they crumble because they are a dead corpse. To that end, it takes an incredible amount of death magic to animate a zombie dragon and a very powerful will to command it. And the emphasis on that will really harkened back to the vampire counts of the old world, where uh, dominating the dead was a matter of willpower. Right, Magic would make them animate, but willpower is what made them do what you say. So if you had two undead armies fighting, it was really just kind of a battle of will between the vampires or the necromancers or whatever it was. And I like that. I like that they kind of reinforce the idea of there is this dark sentience and willpower that really commands undeath. And the zombie dragon flies in. It causes all kinds of devastation. And where it used to breathe fire, it now kind of contorts and twists its torso and bellows out this huge putrid cloud. This acidic breath of just poison and corrosion that destroys anything it touches. 
it saps the life from any living thing and just leaves this husk. And honestly, that's about it for the lore that they give us on the zombie dragon. What I like about both of these units is how different they are. That one is naturally occurring, one's not. They fight in different ways. One is really willpower dependent, the zombie dragon. The other one, it's just a creature who does what he does. And certainly if we think about how they play into the army in yesterday's video, where the flesh of each of them is used to create different units when the Ghoul King infuses his blood with it. The terror guy's flesh is integral to creating crypt flayers, and the zombie dragon flesh, which is of course more rare, is used to create crypt infernal courtiers, the highest level of flare, and leader of the Ghoul King's honor guard. So I didn't feel like they were just kind of tacked in or thrown in the book. I really feel like they did a good job of integrating these into important pieces into any flesh eater core army. Now I want to take a moment and talk about why I love this faction. This week has been a blast. I love when I approach a book knowing kind of some of it, but being incredibly surprised and I think I learned a lot. I learned about the kind of mysterious origins surrounding the Carrion King, who Nagash is still hunting to this day by the way, and how this madness has corrupted his lineage, what that does to the nature of their magic itself and how that magic affects everything around them. Like, it's an aura, it can spike food and drink, it can mutate ghouls, it can be mixed with certain meats for unique controlled mutations. It's also deeply fascinating and interesting. While all these units had cool things to add to the army, it really is the Ghoul King that defines the narrative for your force, and I like that. I went over that in his video about why I think it's so great to have a central character that defines the tone of your army. It makes narratives incredibly simple when there's a central unifying point where if you focus on that one guy, the rest of the faction's lore just kind of naturally unfolds. And I have to say because of that, I think, I'm going to say it, this is the most narratively flexible book out there. Because of the nature of the delusion and how fickle it can be, your army can be written in just about any way. Whether your ghoul king is more receptive to outside forces, whether he's very repulsed by them, who he perceives them to be, all those kinds of things, those little elements that you can pull on can really make this, again, the most customizable lore-wise army out there. And I want to end by touching on the most defining thing about this entire force, and that is, of course, the delusion itself. When this book was released in the early days of AOS, I had no idea where the game was headed, or even where this faction was headed. Because these were just always a small splinter of death units that kind of looked too uniform for a book. Like Nothing about them really stood out as like, oh, that is of particular interest. The basic ghoul kit was not super fascinating, but the delusion changed all of that. Because suddenly, you have the modeling potential of what they are, right? That, that nasty, grotesque, impish kind of thing. That's literally what they are. But you also gained this possibility of what they think they are. And from there, the story-building elements exploded. People went from kind of writing off this sub-faction, as we're all looking at the early release of the app, to having serious debates about, hey, is this Bretonia? Like, is this where Bretonia went? Because they often act like Bretonia in terms of knights and heraldry and all that stuff like that. We went from seeing AOS as black and white to understanding that perspective really matters and that perspective can be distorted and corrupted. We learned that you can reject a god because some of these flesh eater courts reject Nagash. This is one of the first times we ever saw that. And we learned that you can truly believe you're doing the right thing only to end up being the villain in someone else's story. This is the stuff that great tales are made from. You combine that with the new way they kind of internally kit bash their own kits, and this faction offered us, and still offers us, a lot of unique concepts to the game and the AOS universe. It's absolutely magnificent. I sat here, every time I do it in these lower weeks, I think to myself, I could... I could rock that army, and I'm sitting here looking at the Flesh Eater Courts and be like, no, this is legitimately one of the coolest factions out there because of the delusion. I have too many things going on right now. I can't get into this army. I'm, I'm holding off, but it is extremely tempting because of how fascinating I find their lore. So friends, those are my thoughts on the Flesh Eater Courts. It's been a great week. I really hope you enjoyed it. If you liked this series of videos, please give it a like and subscribe. It would mean the world to me. Thank you all so much for being so involved in the comments, having great discussion about kind of the nature of the craziness within this faction. I appreciate the conversation. It's always fun to engage with y'all. 
And I look forward to seeing you in my next Age of Sigmar lore video, kicking off next week as we talk about the Beasts of Chaos. Thank you all so much for watching, and happy wargaming.